Hi, everyone, and welcome to Connect Spring. My name is Peter Gianetti with the International Housewares Association, and this is today's keynote presentation, Lessons from Across Industries. Uh, a couple of housekeeping notes before we get started today. The speakers will be taking questions at the end of the session. I'll handle that when we get uh, toward the end. So please go ahead and use the Q&A function at the bottom of your Zoom screen to submit your questions at any time during the session. And these sessions are being recorded and they'll be available on IHA's website within two weeks of the event's conclusion, so by around mid-April, so stay tuned for that. Before we start, I do wanna thank today's session sponsor, Lasco Products, and I'm gonna turn it over to Inger Heller from Lasco to say a few words. Inger? Thanks, Peter, I'm happy to be here. I'm Inger Heller, Director of Customer Experience at Lasco. This year, we celebrate 115 years of American innovation. At LASCO, we are focused on home environment categories and have leading market positions in fans, heaters, and with our recent acquisition of Guardian Technologies, air purifiers. Our mission is to improve everyday life with trusted products, which create a healthier and more comfortable home environment. That was underscored in the last year as our customers, our consumers, and our associates adapted to new work from home environments and needed comfort more than ever. We remain committed to and strategically focused on the expansion of our domestic production to meet the needs of our customers and the communities in which we operate. During these uncertain times, we added US jobs with the introduction of products, including our domestic made cyclonic ceramic heater and our Airflex air purifier and room fan in one. This spring, we introduced our Slumber Breeze personal fan with white noise to support personal wellness and an outdoor rechargeable battery fan to make the most of outdoor living. Check out these products and more at lasco.com. Thank you. Thank you, Inger, and thanks to Lasco for sponsoring today's session. With that, I would like to introduce our speakers. All of them are from the NPD Group, who is a partner in Connect Spring. Uh, we have Joe Derachowski, who's the Home Industry Advisor, Steve Baker, who's the Technology Industry Advisor, Larissa Jensen, who's the Beauty Industry Advisor, David Portolatin, who's the Food Industry Advisor, and Matt Powell, who's the Sports Industry Advisor for NPD. Complete bios of our speakers are available on the Connect Spring page at theinspiredhomeshow.com. Thanks, thanks everyone for being here. Let's get started. You know, the home and houses industry saw record growth from this pandemic. Other industries saw similar growth and others faced significant headwinds. Some adapted and they thrived. Others continue to fight for their ongoing viability. Today, we're going to examine what we in the housewares business can learn from these other key consumer industries and, and, and what from their experience can our industry do to adapt. Let's start with Joe first. Uh, Joe, it's, it's, it's more important than ever, I, I feel, to take a wider view of consumer behavior and spending. What are we hoping to kind of learn today and what can you tell the industry about taking that wider view? Well, I think a lot of times innovation sometimes starts by just having that broader view. We all get stuck in our day-to-day -day lives and we're so focused on what's in front of us in the trees that sometimes it's these things that we happen around us that if we can see and listen and, and think about it differently, that it kind of opens up a new way to think of new products or new marketing or new ways to address business issues. Uh, I have the good fortune of meeting uh, with these folks here. Uh, it used to be quarterly and now we do it, uh, try to do it weekly. And it's phenomenal. Every time we're together, there's, there's something that they say that's going on in our industry that makes me go, you know what? Our industry could learn from that. Our industry could try this. It gets me to think of something different. The second part is these guys are very, very smart in what they do. Uh, they're also love to debate and very creative folks. So I think it'll be fun for everybody today. But what I hope is that we're gonna to touch on some big issues that our industry is doing that they're also facing. And we'll just have a conversation to find out how are they addressing it? What are they learning? What's the lessons? And see what we can apply to our businesses. Well, I think it's important. You noted that you used to speak quarterly and now you're speaking weekly. And I think that's a message to the industry yeah. that this kind of cross industry evaluation of what's going on uh, in retailing and consumer behavior is sort of something that everyone sort of needs to adapt to uh, and, and try to get the answers on an ongoing basis. It's not a, it's not a one and done scenario. 
David, uh, let's let's start with the food business uh, because I think there's a lot of people right now who are wondering with with the vaccinations rolling out uh, and to some degree, you know, we're, we're kind of starting to see that light at the end of the tunnel uh, or at least a flicker of that light at the end of the tunnel. I think one of, let's, let's start first with your perspective on when you think people will start returning uh, to restaurants and maybe kind of mitigate some of that home uh, meal uh, activity we had and to what level that's gonna happen over the, over the next several weeks, months, et cetera. Yeah, thanks, Peter. Uh, you know, as you said, vaccinations are going up, case counts are going down. That means that uh, people are gradually more comfortable uh, with returning outside of the home. And of course, that's going to naturally lead to some improvement in the restaurant uh, side of the food business. <clears throat> but what people are going to have to remember is that the, the pre-pandemic trajectory we were on for the five years prior to the onset of COVID, the total customer traffic in the restaurant space was very, very flat, actually declined about three tenths of a percent you know, over those five years. So when the restaurant industry talks about return to a pre-pandemic normal, that's sort of what we're talking about returning to. And more importantly, uh, if you look at uh, what, what's happened over this time, you know, at present, for example, the American consumer is preparing about 6% more dinner meals at home. Uh, than they had to uh, in the past. So, so there is a tremendous amount of tension at dinner. Nobody gave us 6% more hours in the day or 6% more culinary skills or 6% more recipe ideas. You know, one of the reasons when I talk to Joe that we, we get excited and we exchange all this information about is you look at everything that's happened in the kitchen uh, over the last year, it's all about that tension at dinner. So even on the restaurant side of the equation, all of the momentum is really about solving what happens in the home. So that's why we see delivery going up and uh, you know, carry out orders going up, uh, especially those that are, that are ordered electronically. So um, if the question is, you know, how long till the restaurant industry gets back to where we were before the pandemic? Maybe we don't. Right. Now, I, I don't want to seem uh, too pessimistic because we are forecasting you know, some incremental uh, growth over the next, uh, you know, several months for the restaurant space, but whether it ever really comes back uh, to where we were uh, before the pandemic, uh, that's still in doubt. Right. The, 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 industry, the restaurant industry was really on the, the front lines of developing strategy and practices to, to serve the consumer uh, at the early, even at the earliest stages of the pandemic, and that's evolved. So how has, what, what, what can we learn? What, what did the industry do that sort of transcends the restaurant business that we can begin to apply to other industries and the home and housewares business? Yeah, I like to tell people in, in many respects, we fast forwarded five years into the future in about five months time. So again, you know, in the five years pre-pandemic, digital orders at restaurants, those restaurant orders where we placed on a smartphone or on a website, they were growing at a compound annual growth rate of 23% a year. Well, if you were to just take that pre-pandemic trajectory and how many digital orders would we have five years from now? We're there now. Uh, we've seen an increase uh, of more than 500 million uh, orders annually that are going through a smartphone. Now, I, I know my colleagues here can speak to this and the rest of the retail world, you guys call this BOPUS, buy online, pick up in store. In the restaurant space, we just call it takeout. It's been around forever. We've just now found a frictionless, convenient, high customer satisfaction uh, way to do it uh, through digital technology. And again, it, it sort of relates back to what I said earlier. It's all about taking the restaurant experience and moving it into the home. It's not all delivery. Uh, so, you know, delivery is obviously a, a hot topic and it's growing, right. but the largest behavior and the fastest growing behavior is not digitally ordered for delivery, it's digitally ordered for takeout. I, as the consumer, will go and pick it up. And I really believe in the food industry. And one way we may be a little different than some other spaces, I think when it comes to this idea of last mile delivery, the consumer is very willing to own that last mile in food. They have a little more control. It's a little more affordable. It's more profitable for the restaurant operator. Uh, and that's where, if I were placing bets in the food space, uh, I'd really be trying to figure out how can I unlock a digitally enabled takeout business. Thanks, David. Joe, I know you've talked about looking to this trend as something that is, it should be 
on the eyes of everyone in the home and housewares business. What, what do you think the industry, the home and housewares industry right now, can learn and, and, and apply from this? Well, there's a couple things. One, I thought it's fascinating how, like right now, about 95% of our orders are delivered to your home if you order it online. And so when you hear how much that's very different than the takeout uh, numbers, and listening to David talk about how restaurants are investing of moving some of the center of the store, the back of the store to the center of the store, of adding drive-through lanes, of making innovations to even make it easier and faster to get in and out. I sit here and I think of our industry and what we've done this past year. There's a lot, a lot of innovations that's happened, but we're still got a long ways to go from an innovation of making it easier for that consumer to be able to get the order and get out on time and to stay in control. So it's one of the things that when you watch the restaurant industry, they're so innovative that we need to keep pushing ourselves. So whenever I hear David talk, I keep thinking, what can we do to improve our buy online pickup in store? Could it be drive through? Are there faster ways? There are some restaurants that they see your car coming up, they're already walking out, bringing the order. Like, what can we really do to speed up that process of buy online and, and pick up in store? And the second thing- we, we heard from our, our session this morning that that last encounter, whether it's buy online, pick up in store, that last encounter is, is gonna be the one, the thing that perhaps people remember the most and it will have a lot to do with uh, kind of that, that building consumer trust and loyalty. From the other industry advisors here, is, uh, is there any parallels or any uh, scenarios within your, uh, within your universe to kind of uh, where the restaurant industry has been and, and what can be gleaned from that? Yeah, I, let me jump in. Uh, a really interesting story, case study with uh, Dick Sporting Goods, um, who, who chose to close all of their stores uh, as the pandemic rolled out, even in states where they were allowed to be open. Um, and they very quickly, within 72 hours, had developed a, a BOPUS system that really worked, and they continued to tweak it as they went through. Um, but it was one of the things that really saved them in the early days of, uh, of the lockdowns was uh, how fast they were able to pivot to curbside pickup. Uh, and, uh, and so I think that nimbleness uh, uh, that they displayed here um, uh, really uh, was a, a, a huge part of their success. Uh, Matt, let's let's stay with you for a second. Uh, going kind of from the food industry to the sporting goods and sports uh, uh, industry, you know, we don't necessarily think of parallels uh, between those two. But you had to go th through um, that industry had to go through its own changes. But there were there were companies that were sort of ahead of the curve before the pandemic hit, uh, you know, in terms of direct to consumer, in terms of getting consumers used to a, an omni-channel or harmonized experience. What, what are some of the things that, talk, talk about your business for a second that you follow and how that kind of progressed through the pandemic. Sure. Uh, well, I think the the footwear industry in particular has been at the forefront of, uh, of growing the online business. And it really started with retailers like Zappos uh, many years ago, where, you, you know, I was with a dot com around 2000, and we thought no one would buy shoes online because of the fit issues. Uh, and it actually turns out that the footwear has one of the highest penetrated uh, e-commerce businesses. Last year in the U.S., about 40 percent of all athletic shoes were purchased online. Um, and, and part of I think that's driven the brands to understand that they have a role in this as well. Um, and the brands are really interested, I think, in, in direct to consumer for three primary reasons. Um, first of all, uh, it allows them to really control the way their brand is imaged. Um, anytime a retail buyer buys a line, they're editing that line. They are taking parts of it out that the, that the brand had envisioned being a part of their assortment, part of their brand story. Um, and uh, online brands can control all of that. They also can leverage all of their assets. Uh, they're the athletes that they're paying huge endorsement contracts to can be leveraged on those sites. Um, uh, so I think it's, a, it's about control of, of the brand and control of the message. Number two, uh, the margins that they make are significantly higher than their wholesale margins because they're actually realizing the retail margin as well. Um, and while expenses are higher shipping out a pair at a time as opposed to pallets or trailer trucks full of, of shoes, um, the brands have figured out how to bring some of that, that number down as well. Um, and then third, and probably really most importantly from a long-term perspective, uh, is that the brands are getting much more knowledge, direct knowledge about who their customers are, what their preferences are, how frequently they shop, 
um, and, uh, and, and getting much closer to those customers that have been able to really communicate one-on-one. -on -one. There's a lot of talk today about getting back to really personalized shopping uh, where the brand knows exactly the products that I want to buy and they're only feeding me those products. Uh, and so that level of sophistication is, uh, is really critical. On the downside, it's really forced the brands to evaluate uh, very closely who their wholesale partners are and who they want to be their wholesale partners going forward. And virtually every major brand in the space has said publicly that they are going to be reducing the number of wholesale partners that they have. Um, and so the industry continues to consolidate naturally as we're going through this. And that's, that's a, a painful but necessary thing. And then, then it's being accelerated by brands uh, literally withdrawing their products from uh, some of their long-term uh, retail partners. But let's stay on direct to consumer for a second, but look at it from a slightly different perspective. And I just want to do a quick around the horn or have one of the other industry advisors chime in. What, are, what can the retailers learn from the, obviously the increased move to direct to consumer, whether it's depending on this business, because obviously that, that takes them sort of out of the loop. Can they get back in the loop and are they finding ways to get in the loop? Joe, let's start with you, you on that for a second. I think the, the big issue is when you're doing a one-off transaction, that's one part of it. But a lot of times when people are shopping for our goods, they're trying to solve a life moment. Like you just moved into a new home and there's many things that you need to buy or it's your wedding and there's many items. And so it's that broad assortment that you're needing to provide the overall need, whether it's that occasion or that life moment that is really gonna help the retailers kind of focus on how can I really solve that big area. The second part is just the education that goes into products and, and what can we learn from that? There's different ways that brands communicate those benefits and is there a way that we can evolve the marketing uh, across the board, even from a retailer's website, uh, in ways that make it not only be about the consumer and their needs, but the brand story, being able to tell it in a different and better way as well. Anyone else want to talk about that? That yeah. symbiotic biotic relationship. Yeah, I was gonna, I was gonna jump in from a beauty perspective because I think to Joe's point, the brand assortment is really kind of what sets, you know, the retailer.coms apart from the the DTC and in beauty specifically, for example, we don't consumers don't typically buy from one brand. They're, they're brand agnostic. They pretty much shop across brands and they shop for hero items. And that's something that the retailers, you know, do provide. And, you know, to, to Matt's point, beauty um, is actually along with sneakers, one of the higher penetrated um, industries as well. We're at 40%. I don't believe it's as high as tech, um, but, you know, for a soft lines industry, we're one of the highest. Um, so there is consumer interest in, in purchasing online and that need is there. But at the end of the day, beauty is very experiential and, and brick and mortar is incredibly important, um, at least for my industry, my categories. Steven, tech, tech obviously has a strong um, e-commerce uh, component yeah. to it has for a while. Where does it all stand right now from this D to C versus buying, buying from the, uh, the, the retailer? Uh Yes, thanks, Peter. I'm going to take a little bit of a different approach to this. Um, did clearly, <laughs> all, as I will always do. Um, it's nice that you have a selection of categories from a retailer, as Joe is talking about. But in tech, I really don't think that's the, the leverage that an online uh, retailer can use to um, differentiate themselves from direct. For the most part in technology, it's a transaction business, right? We're looking for a television or a cable or a cartridge and you're comparing one product to another. Yeah, you might pick up something else, that's great, but there's a one product that I'm really focused on. And the value of the retailer tends to be that I can offer you the ability to compare across multiple brands, and multiple products, but it's not like other retailers online. It's not an overwhelming amount of comparison. So there's curation, right? I know the top 10 SKUs that you might want to be able to buy of this 
65 inch television. And here's a selection based on price and quality and brand. And you can pick across those. If you just go to the TV brands website, there may just be two or three uh, choices there. So you don't have that ability uh, as a consumer to make those choices. And as a brand, um, on the one hand, you want people to come to your direct site. On the other hand, um, you're really only getting people who already want your brand. So if you want to be in the comparison uh, set of what am I going to decide between X, Y, and Z, then I really need to be at a retailer as well so that I can take share and take sales from my competitors. Joe, to David, uh, to Steve's point, uh, I think a lot of the housewares business has been sort of transactional the last uh, several months. It was kind of what can I get my hands on when I can get it uh, and when can it be delivered? But it's going to evolve as we progress here to going back to that idea of curated assortment. Um, uh, you know, so it's aspirational as well as transactional. In wrapping up this question on kind of you know, how to manage the, the, this, this D to C versus B, B to C or B to B. Uh, how, how, where, where, do we, where do we kind of end up here in terms of what the, the balance needs to be? Well, uh, I think balance is a good way. We're right about now 50-50 roughly uh, across the board. I think it's going to be there. You know, one of the things that Steve said that I thought was interesting and it sometimes gets lost is when you're buying, like we're, we have a lot of purchases coming from people 55 plus, but then we have a tremendous amount that's happening from that 18 to 34 year old range too. And so that group is still learning how to do some of these things. And when you're buying stuff, sometimes you just want somebody to go, yeah, that's right. It's okay. Right. It's a good purchase. There's a, there's a validation. And so the, the store itself, like Steve said, gets you to, cro to cover many brands and look at many brands across it, but it also gives you a little bit of confidence in what you're purchasing. But what the online and direct to consumer is also going to be able to help out is it really is telling the story. That's one of the things our industry the last five, 10 years is getting better at, but we still got room to grow is how do we tell our story? How do we fit into the consumer's lives uh, and let them tell their story as opposed to just parroting what we want them to say? And so I think this gives a vehicle to help make that happen in an innovation space for it. And, and as we've learned earlier, telling the story has to be consistent across platforms. Uh, yeah. You, you, you have what you stand for has to has to be pushed. Matt, before I uh, wrap up with you, uh, one quick question. I, I'm sure a lot of our uh, people in our audience are, are curious to this like they are about rest, the return to restaurant behaviors. What, what's the status of kind of return to recreational uh, team sports, uh, rec, uh, recreational team sports, league team sports, and kind of how, how, how do you see that progressing through the year? Because that obviously changes the at home dynamic a little bit. And, That's and a how great question. I, too. I, it's really a, it's a, a, a tale of two cities or tale of two worlds here. Um, the the scholastic sports businesses, baseball, softball, soccer, uh, football, lacrosse, and so forth, uh, absolutely got torched last year. Um, most school systems did not play sports in the spring. Um, um, some started to play sports last fall, um, but uh, those businesses were very, very challenged. Um, the, the baseball business, for instance, in the spring went to virtually zero. Um, uh, in talking to the National High School uh, Coaches or High School uh, Sports uh, Directors Asso Association, they're telling me that they think we'll be back to pretty much full capacity in scholastic sports by, um, by mid-May. Uh, and many states are going to be uh, pretty much on their normal schedule. Um, so uh, that's really good news. Uh, the, that part of the business is, making a, is going to make a strong comeback. The other interesting thing that's happened under, under COVID was that uh, we saw a, a really renewed interest and commitment on the part of the consumer to live a healthy lifestyle. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, and, and we saw those activities where people could get out and try to stay fit and remain socially distant in some way uh, were, the, were the activities that thrived. So running and hiking and footwear, um, uh, the golf business up 39% last year, uh, racket sports business up 35%. Um, and so, uh, and then, and then we, when they closed the gyms uh, again, early in the pandemic, the home, home fitness business went off the charts and those sales were up about over 80%, the bicycle business up over 50%. Um, and frankly, some of those numbers 
numbers could have been much higher because nobody obviously anticipated having those kinds of increases and there were inventory outages all over the place. So uh, really saw a, a surge in, in, in staying fit and, and remaining socially distanced activities. David, go ahead. Yeah, here, here's why I think this is important for the audience. Here's why I follow Matt on the home gym experience. Because I think it's directly relevant to the home kitchen experience. And the way I view it is that the consumer has created capacity to do life at home in a variety of ways. I follow uh, Baker on the technology. We have a toy analyst that I follow on the stuff for the kids. And, and if you look at some of these categories all told, the consumer, in my view, has built a, a tremendous new capacity to do things at home that I don't think that just because the COVID numbers change, we're going to completely stop utilizing all that increased capacity. Right. So to the extent that we're going to continue to work out at home because we bought an elliptical machine or, or what have you, um, we've, we've bought uh, toaster ovens and soda machines and coffee makers uh, for the home. Um, I, this is part of the reason that I'm forming, forming this view that the shift toward at home um, has some permanence to it. Joe. And, and I think to build on what David's saying there is when I hear Matt talk too, it sits there and think about those kids' activities in the evening. When that starts to come back, then there's a little bit of pressure around the preparation and cooking phase that wasn't there during right. the pandemic. And so when that comes back, then how are we going to respond? Because we're going to ideally want to keep the same behaviors that we did during the pandemic, because we were eating better and we we're eating more as a family and things of that nature. So now when you get a time pressure, what's going to happen? And that's going to really open up the door for some innovation opportunities there. And that plays out at all the occasions. And one of the things David talked about with us being more at home is really the increase in lunch consumption as well. And we've never, the Monday to Friday lunch, we've never really had to challenge that. And I think it's a huge innovation opportunity for us to help in that space, should we go to some sort of hybrid or whatever the case may be, to be able to leverage that change in behavior. This is a great demonstration of how interconnected all of these behaviors and fundamentally all these businesses have become. You know, uh, again, the simple act of going back to, you know, league soccer is going to have a trickle down into whether or not you eat at home, take out, uh, and, and what that opportunity is for the industry. Um, the I, problem with all this home capacity for poor Larissa is nobody puts on their makeup to have dinner at home. Well, David, that was a perfect segue into our conversation <laughs> with Larissa. Uh, Thank Larissa, you, David. Uh, uh, the, home, uh, the home business includes personal care appliances. Obviously, that plays directly into, into, into what you follow. But beauty is a broader business, much broader business than that. Let's start a little bit about what happened with the beauty business uh, in, uh, during the pandemic and kind of where it is right now. Uh, and then we'll kind of drill into kind of the opportunity for, for, for the home business. Sure. If you notice, one of the industries David did not mention that he was watching is beauty. <laughs> but, but, but I do actually, I do pay attention to David's industries. When he talks about restaurants, it's super important, especially with beauty. Like he was saying, you know, you're not going to put makeup on to eat at home, but you will put makeup on if you're going out on a date um, to, to eat at a restaurant. Or, you know, if you just go out, you know, beauty is a usage occasion category for the most part. Um, especially the makeup category, which is, you know, the one that is the largest category in beauty. So beauty is inclusive of makeup, skincare, and fragrances, as well as hair. Hair is very important. And I know Joe and I um, talk about hair a lot together, um, you know, with the styling tools on his side and then the products on my side. It's only important to three out of the six of us, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that's okay. It's, it's so the point is like, when you think about what happened in beauty, we were hit really hard. You know, if you think about the stay at home economy, there were certain things that we did see in beauty that kind of played into that. Um, we did participate to a degree. So there were things like treating ourselves. So the spa at home, and this is inclusive of things like candles and body care and skincare devices. So not necessarily the hair devices, but the devices that you know uh, tone your skin, uh, laser and, and such that consumers could do at home. We actually saw really strong growth there. These are all very small areas of the market though. So really not enough to offset huge losses. Just for context, 
We declined 19%, and this is the prestige beauty um, space, declined 19% last year and lost close to $4 billion at Hertz to say this, and it brought us back to 2015 levels. So really all of the growth that we saw in those little areas was really not enough to offset anything. You know, we also saw things like hair color, of course, you know, growing as salons were closed, um, nail care products, you know, nail salons, and whether when they opened it back up again, were consumers, you know, really comfortable going back there. So that was one thing, you know, we also saw things that like, you know, and still in the theme of treating ourselves, because I think beauty was very much about this wellness and mental well-being, like how can we really um, escape, you know, what's happening around us? And one of the things that we found, which was a happy little surprise, was the growth of fragrance. I like to reference fragrance as like the new lipstick index. Are you guys familiar with the lipstick index? It's the idea of, you know, sales of lipstick going up during times of depression or economic hard times. Um, we didn't see that happen this time. You know, in a pandemic, we've got our face masks on. Lipstick mm -hmm. is not quite as important, you know? So we did see actually fragrances was the lipstick index. Interesting. It's basically this non-essential treat. That, you know, it was it's like almost you don't that, how, how other people's, how you smelled for other people was how you sort of smelled for yourself in many ways, yeah. Also, yes, but also if you think about fragrance, I mean, all of beauty is so emotional, but fragrance is, is especially emotional. Like you smell something, this is in science, it, it brings you back to a different time. You know, you can immediately be transported to someplace else. And I think there's an element of that as well, you know, um, and, and you know, consumers really using this to kind of make themselves feel better um, mm -hmm. during difficult times. I mean, fragrance is into 2021 is growing double digits still. Like but really, it, it is really interesting that such an indulgent business at its core was put in a position to really go into hyperdrive with promotions during uh, 2020. And that almost creates, you talk about sticky behavior, it almost creates this uh, expectation on the part of the industry that even when things come back and I want to make myself look better or feel better about myself, I'm going to still expect that heightened promotional activity. Talk a little bit about that. And then Joe, I want to turn it over to you to talk about uh, the, the, the trap and the opportunity of uh, the, the opportunity and the trap of something like that. Talk about promotions, yeah. Larissa. Promotions are definitely um, much, they've accelerated. Um, yeah. And I do see it a little bit as a trap. I kind of liken it to the idea of like, you know, it's a one crowded one way street. Once you start going down that path, it is really, really hard to turn around. And, you know, what we track at NPD is Prestige Beauty. So this is beauty products that are sold at department stores, specialty stores. I've been in the industry for over 20 years. There was a time when every sale excluded cosmetics and fragrances. Right. That is not the case anymore. It is completely different. And we thought, you know, in 2019, we thought, wow, this is crazy. We had 63% of our weeks on some sort of promotion. And then enter 2020. There was only one week where we didn't have promotion, just one. And it was, you know, it was really crazy. It was sort of like the, the industry was, I mean, I get it. They were trying to move through inventory and, and trying to move product through. But when you think about the category that was uh, promoted the most, so fragrances actually wasn't promoted the most. Um, it was makeup that was promoted the most. And, you know, and it was also the category that declined the most. Right. So in many ways, like I like to, to think about Europe as an example, because Europe has been highly promotional in beauty for a very long time. So in France, for example, 75% of beauty products are sold at a discount of 10% or more. These are like tech numbers in here in the US. It's like you buy a tech item that's not on sale. It's like, you know, who's the sucker, right? But in, in we'll, France, we'll get we have Steve seen on any... that. In a, in a <laughs> yes, bit, I'm, I'm segueing into Steve. <laughs> But you know that hasn't really helped recovery there and it's not really helping recovery here. And at the end of the day, it's the consumers have now become to expect this, right? They're expecting promotions, they know the rules. Can, and, can, you know, and quickly, it, can we wean them off of that over time or no? That's, that's the point. Like it really isn't creating that value anymore. And it's sort of like an industry-wide dynamic that it, I think is going to effectively change how our consumer shops are category forever, right? So it's really about finding alternative ways to participate in the promotional environment without, you know, undermine your brand equity. Interesting. Joe, where does Houseware stand and what can it learn from that? I think the big thing is, is her whole story. Like we're, we've done very, very well. You gotta believe at some point over the next year, two, three, whatever, there's gonna be a point where we're gonna struggle to grow. We can talk to Steve a little bit about his forecasting too. And so the question is, is 
how much do you bite into that apple of promotion and how quickly and how frequently. And so when I hear Larissa talk, I think about what happened to casual dining restaurants you know, after 2008, that recession. And Steve, recently, you said a story last week, Steve, I think that's a good one for people to hear, just even on promotions you know, that you saw in one of the studies you had. So I just thought it'd be good to, what we learned from the restaurant industry? Is there anything they learned over time to help rebound? And then same thing with Steve, recently, some of the promotions that we're seeing in tech, what are we learning? Well, David, let's let's address the restaurant promotions. Then we're going to go right to Steve. I mean, everybody uh, everybody sells things on deal now. Um, you know, deal rates are as high as they've ever been. You know, what I try to remind people in the restaurant space all the time: we're a little bit different. You know, you guys have retailers uh, in the restaurant space. The brand and the retailer are, are synonymous with one another. Um, so you know, oftentimes you can have a differentiated value proposition that the consumer is willing to pay a premium for, and I still may shop the retailer that gives me the best deal on that premium. So that's a dynamic that you guys have to deal with more than, right. than the restaurant operator. I think for, for the restaurant operator, we have to be very careful because people don't choose restaurants because it's the least expensive uh, means of feeding ourselves. If, if we were really looking for a cheap meal, we go to the grocery store every time. Mm -hmm. When we choose a restaurant, there are all kinds of other reasons for that. It, it's, our, it's our cravings, it's our favorites, it's our treats, rewards, the things that we uh, don't have the ability to, to make for ourselves. And I would be, you know, I, I'm very cautious about, uh, you know, discounting those too deeply. And there are some cautionary tales uh, out there. I, I think you can all remember a very famous uh, a foot long sandwich that was offered at a special price a few years ago and now rarely is because it's not sustainable. And once the customer has that expectation it's virtually impossible to uh, wean them off of it. Yeah. Uh, Steve, what's the story Joe's talking about? The example that you, that you asked me. Well, the first thing I want to um, talk about is, so when David and Larissa talk about those kind of things, you want to frame it in why the way tech does things and way we do things with um, in housewares and footwear, even sneakers, things go on sale that are more um, that aren't consumables, right? In general, you don't want to put consumables on sale because people are going to buy those at some point. I'm going to go to McDonald's. I'm going to buy beauty. If I have a, an ink printer, I'm going to buy ink for it at some point. Um, giving somebody a deal on it probably isn't going to make them buy it any sooner than they were going to buy otherwise. When you talk about hard goods like toaster ovens and air fryers and computers, um, those have to be promoted to remind people that it's time to buy things. Sure, stuff breaks and somebody's going to, going to want to go and they're going to have to buy something. But the primary way you get people to buy is you promote things. And part of that is, so, you know, I think in, in food and in beauty, there's really actual pricing. So the whole idea that things are on sale in tech is not really true because there really is no set price for a television. And by the way, I can buy a 65 inch television that costs $500 and I can buy one that costs $5,000 too, right? Because the product is different. There's different quality levels. There's different branding levels. So there's always choices there. And promotion is much more about um, trying to steal business from somebody else mm. than to create incremental demand all the time. Um, I think what Joe is talking about is we've seen promotions come down a lot in tech over the last year, but it's really almost exclusively has to do with, you're not going to run a promotion if you've got two weeks of inventory right. or you don't know where it's coming from. And where there has been inventory of mostly in more premium products, what we actually see is even there, while there's still plenty of promotion, uh, the levels of promotion have declined because if there aren't any 
promotions on entry level or mid level products, or frankly, there aren't any of those products to buy, then um, I need to entice people both to sell, to purchase up and buy a more expensive product. And I have some more margin there that I can provide that will let me make it a little bit cheaper and make it a little bit easier for people to trade up. And when they trade up, uh, I'll make more money. And certainly um, in my purchasing of, of housewares in the last year, I've made those kind of decisions, right? Mm -hmm. How good is this product? Does it solve the need? Um, is it, what's the right price point for it? Um, and then tech, tech does a good job of controlling the perception of obsolescence, perhaps uh, more than some other industries. Maybe uh, like in sporting goods, golf does that very well in terms of converting uh, passionate people to a new product on an annual basis. Uh, is that something that is going to have to continue to, is, is, are they continuing to do that? Are they looking at that as a way of per, the perception of new innovation rather, you know, rather than when it's really just incremental? Yeah, I, uh, it, that's a great question. You know, I, the sports industry is clearly one of built, built around aspiration and inspiration, people wanting to play their game better, wanting to jump higher, run faster, whatever it might be. Um, and sometimes the innovations that are touted really don't, don't do a lot of that, but they create the illusion uh, that I'm going to be able to play my sport better. And, and so the real enthusiast is, uh, is very, very much concerned about what's the new and the next thing. Right. The other interesting thing though the flip of it is that we during this pandemic we've introduced so many new participants to sports um, and I fear in some cases they've been oversold product they've been sold product that's above their ability uh, above their competency and uh, they're going to be very dissatisfied with those products and we could lose some new participants because uh, because they, they they were sold the wrong the wrong level of product uh, in the beginning um, mm -hmm. And then just on this promotional thing, you know, we've seen very a, a real decline in promotions in, in many places in the industry because uh, there hasn't been a big inventory glut. Uh, the brands probably had the biggest issue in footwear and in apparel, and they were promotional on their own websites. But at retail, we were much less promotional and average selling prices are up uh, as a consequence. Steve, if you take the inventory shortages out of the equation and the fact that price obviously is a, a key component, did the consumers show, and will they show a willingness to uh, step up and upgrade continually going forward? Um, continually is always a question, right? Uh, but certainly today, I think what people did was buy things that they knew would solve the problem today. Um, but in, in tech, we're always trying to future proof, at least to some level. Uh, so yeah, I, you know, we definitely saw people buy, buy better when they could, but um, I think when the inventory balance comes back, uh, we'll see some of the, the selling prices come back down again. Um, some of that's just not necessarily sustainable uh, from a product perspective, but if it does change the market's view of how frequently I have to be aggressive on pricing, even at the entry level. I think that's the real question over the next 18 months, which is um, what's the bottom, right? Not the mid or the top, but wh what's the bottom price I have to be? Do I really need to sell that 65 inch TV for 449? Or can I really sell it for $4.99 or $5.99 and make that the new bottom um, and get a little bit above cost as opposed to being so promotional and so aggressive? Um, on the other hand, I will tell you that at least some of that's out of the hands of the brands. And over the next year or two, um, some of that's going to drop back to the retailer. And we'll start to see maybe retailers uh, competing with each other and trying to uh, make statements with pricing again. Joe, lesson learned from technology for home and housewares, uh, even also in the context of home increased activity and home entertaining, whether that sticks, uh, people are going to continue to kind of spend as much time watching movies, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, at home, working uh, with home technology, office equipment, all that stuff. Yeah, it's, it's one of the things that I love when we get together because you just hear how all 
these things weave together. Uh, and Matt, by the way, talk to your manufacturer because I keep buying golf clubs that are supposed to solve my game. And <laughs> just don't they? They're, it's false advertising. Um, but no, it just, you know, you think about it. Most of it, and David, his food data will talk about a lot of times when we're eating our meals, uh, we're actually doing it in front of the television. So when you start hearing uh, from seeing uh, the sales of smaller televisions, we see things being uh, the, the projectors, the way to do it outside the yards or into garages. Like we just saw how a lot of times this all ultimately ties back to food. And so when you hear some of the changes, that's where it plays out. I think I'd be curious what these guys think about, but I believe we're going to be eating more still probably a little bit outside because we're going to be craving it in 2021. Uh, I'm not sure about the, the garages, what we saw before here in last fall. Like we can have people come inside that might probably come inside. Uh, but I'd be curious what these guys are thinking as, as we go away from home. Are you seeing more and more televisions and projectors outside? Are you seeing more uh, uh, people eating outside? Uh, things of like that. What's your perspective on that? Let's go around the horn, Steve. Well, um, yeah, sure, except, right, an outside television is pretty expensive. So um, I, I can, you know, uh, uh, idea of one, my son was carrying the TV from one room outside and putting it outside on the deck and watching the TV there as opposed to leaving a TV outside. And, you know, outside is great if you live in, you know, LA, if you live in Chicago, probably there's a lot of months where you're not necessarily going outside. Um, I think before people were just looking for products that solved problems. Um, going forward, those problems may not be as acute, but I think people's behaviors will change permanently. And then they're gonna to wanna to find ways to um, buy products that reflect what that, that change behavior is. David, in, your, in the context of the food industry, inside, outside, uh, takeout, to take home, uh, where's it all? What, what what's next? Where do we what do we look for next? I mean, you you are going to see there is pent up demand for dining out. That's for sure. Uh, now, is it going to uh, get back to a pre pandemic level? Not anytime soon. Uh, but the key there is, you know, when uh, when restrictions are lifted on on premises dining, uh, and when the environment, you know, from a health perspective, gets better in an area. Uh, we definitely see a, a big rebound in dining. So yay, Carissa, people might get dressed up and go, go out to eat more. Um, you know, we've seen examples where uh, in particular locations, when restrictions are lifted, you get, you know, 40 points of improvement in uh, full service restaurant transactions in a week's time. Uh, still far below a year ago. Now, um, it's hard for us to differentiate whether they ate indoors in a dining room or sat outside on a sidewalk or, or whether our at-home dinners are happening out in the, in the backyard more. Uh, one of the things we ought to take a look at, Joe, and maybe you and I connect on this later because I haven't really looked into it. We ought to look at grilling uh, and see what's going on there. Uh, so that's something that we could take a look at. Uh, Larissa, at some point, people are going to get back in groups. Uh, they're going to go to parties with a little few more people than they had last year. Uh, uh, maybe the mask will come off a little bit more than it has been. I mean, it's kind of scary to say you're you're down to 2015 levels. Uh, what's the what's the prognosis? Is it gonna are we gonna get back to a more traditional driver of beauty products, even if some of these promotional behaviors stick or some of the some of the casualization that drove the business sticks? Yeah, you know, I think that as we look to the future, you know, makeup still is the largest category for us. Um, and there will be, there's the share of consumer that's like, you know what, I haven't worn makeup in a long time, it's, and I don't think I really need it. My skincare game is on point because I've been using great skincare all year. But then there's going to be that consumer that is going to want to celebrate. And, you know, what's interesting, when we look at colors and shades, um, some of the colors that we're seeing in eyeshadows particularly and, and eyeliner are fun. They're different. They're like, you know, weird, like greens and purples. And oh, there, there's actually you know, a connection this? to that and home, home goods, home de decorating yeah, it, and things well, like that. No, no, seriously. It, you know, it is, it is. There's a connection in that. Yeah. I believe the consumer will be celebratory, right? right? And so 
as you know, as we come out the other side and we don't know what that's going to look like or what the timetable is for that, you know, if, you know, through the rest of this year, we are still mostly mass mandated, you know, lip products will continue to struggle. So it's really like thinking about, you know, what are the parameters that the consumer is working with in terms of what are the products that might help, you know, help her to, you know, celebrate and, and, and really kind of come out the other side in, in a better place. From our industry, I mean, we're going to see growth um, in 2021, just by nature, the fact that 2020 was so bad, but we will not be getting back to levels even of 2019. We're not predicting that right. yet. So. Matt, are, are we going to see more participation in uh, recreational sports, team sports, that's going to further affect kind of scheduling issues and how the family has time for, for the things that they've sort of had a lot of time for in the last 10, 12 months? Yeah, I, I th absolutely think we're, we're going to see a, b a boom in scholastic sports uh, this spring. Uh, I think we're going to see a boom in uh, people getting out to parks. If you think about it, most of the major uh, uh, national parks and many states closed their parks in the spring. Um, and so people couldn't camp, couldn't hike. Uh, and, and so I, I think we're going to continue to see an explosion here. And, and I think we're going to continue to see a, a high level of interest on staying uh, fit and staying, staying healthy. And I think that's going to drive it. Now, we, we probably won't be able to offset some of the peaks that we saw in, say, in the home fitness business. Uh, but I think there's going to remain a very high interest on the part of the consumer in the home fitness. And they may buy a second piece of equipment. They may buy a way to connect that equipment to the Internet that they already own uh, to enhance it, to recovery products. I mean, so there are extensions here, uh, but I think I think the um, the attitude about healthy and outside and staying fit it remains very very strong. Thanks. Joe, we're going to wrap up with you, but I want there's one question from our audience that I think I'd like to give everyone a chance to discuss, and it's kind of the it's a tricky question. Uh, inflation is is coming. Uh, at what levels we'll find out. Yet there yet it's con conflicting in many respects against. Uh, price sensitivity in certain categories. Uh, let's let's start with let's start with Steve. What's the impact of inflation going to be? Uh, or do you guys have a a sense of of kind of when and how how hard that would will will impact your business? Um, it's never been an issue in tech ever. Um, there are lots of ways around um, inflation, uh, kind of pure inflation. We can always change configurations. You can always play around with things. The bigger economic issues, right? Um, right now around cost, which are you know tight supply chains and the supply chains raising price points. Uh, you know right. economic issues around uh, exchange rates, um, shipping rates, those kind of things. But from a pure you know, and, and I'm not sure how you necessarily s segment inflation away from those kind right. of costs. But like we said earlier, certainly ASPs have gone up partly because costs have gone up, partly because promotions have right. gone down, and partly because people are buying more expensive products. And if over the next year or year and a half, pieces of that start to flip back to what we had seen before, um, you know, I, certain products just can't support having higher selling prices significantly higher than what has been in the past at the entry level kind of price point. So we may not see the same level of cost down that we've seen over the last couple of years, or last 20 years, really. Um, but I don't think we're going to see, you know, um, significant uh, price like for like price increases. David, if, if there's one, oh, go ahead, Joe. Uh, but uh, uh, no, I, I just I'll let David answer. What, what's what's well, the ratio? Inflation food is, home and away. A, right. That, inflation is a huge issue in food, and it's because, as Joe said, we have the in home and the away uh, opportunities, and you know, for the last, you know, most of the last decade, uh, the uh, cost of a restaurant meal has been been increasing. Uh, it, while most of the time the cost of the grocery basket has actually been deflationary. So over time, the relative gap between those two gets wider and wider and wider and wider. And over time, that's a headwind for the restaurant space. It's among the reasons that I'm less optimistic in a 100% restaurant recovery and more optimistic about a, a perpetual shift 
for an in-home meal preparation. I'll give you one little example here. When the pandemic hit and we wiped the grocery store shelves bare, I, I talked to one grocery retailer that says Wagyu beef was completely wiped out of the butcher case. It's the most expensive uh, animal protein in the store. And part of the reason for that is even though it's the priciest thing they sell, it's a fraction of the cost of going out to a steakhouse. So, you know, people that couldn't go out to eat at a nice steakhouse, they just went and got the best cut of beef they could and made it at home. And that's, that's what you'll continue to see if food prices uh, continue to go up. Joe, why don't, you, why don't you wrap up that part of the conversation? Well, no, he said exactly what I was going to cover. The thing we always have in our advantage is it's three to four times cheaper to eat at home. So if, if we see that, that's good news for us. That means you're going to eat more. I mean, there's so many factors, even the cost of delivery, that, that these, these price kind of blockades that add. add. So it, it, I think the valuation, to Steve's point, the way you value a business takes into effect so many more variables uh, than just inflation. The way the, the way the industry values that business, how the what the, the the value the consumer puts on it is an entirely different uh, situation. Uh, I have a couple of uh, uh, one, one question I'm going to pose for uh, Larissa, and I, I want you to try to tie it into the opportunity in home and housewares. Uh, one one person asked, as natural looks become more important. Where is the opportunity for cosmetics in your view? And that relates to preventative cosmetics and anti-aging cosmetics. And that sort of transitions into the possible opportunity for those types of appliances and home products that kind of fall into that realm. Uh, let's start with you on that. Well, yeah, so, so I wanna clarify though, cause natural um, is, I'm thinking it's more like the natural look, right? right. Because natural is also a trend. Um, it's some, it's, you know, we have brands that are natural and I just don't want to clarify that natural brands actually, um, have, have slowed down. The, so we're it's, looking at the appearance, uh, the, the, look. the appearance. Yes. So yeah. looking at, at a natural, at a natural look. So I think, you know, to that degree, I think the opportunity is primarily in skincare, but from a, from a cosmetics perspective, so makeup perspective, the areas that we think are, you know, the opportunities are things like tinted moisturizers, things that kind of give you a better um, look for your, like a look that you have already naturally, but just kind of enhances it. So tinted moisturizers, eyebrow products, maybe mascara, something just to, you know, it's natural, but you know, um, something that, that um, will help the consumer just look a little bit better. And then from, from a houseware perspective, I mean, I think really, you know, if you think about the opportunities in hair, and I want to tie it, bring it back to hair, because I think that is an area, you know, consumers are embracing their natural hair as well. So having devices and tools that can help the consumers, you know, improve their natural hair without hurting or damaging, um, I think would be a big opportunity there, because there's a lot of focus in beauty, as we saw even in, in sports and in food wellness right. is a big thing. And I think that's a big part of it as well. Joe, what have the numbers told you about these, th th this area of uh, facial care uh, and, and, and uh, you know, all these things that are, are, are part appearance, but also have a wellness aspect to it as, uh, in addition? Well, I mean, during the pandemic, uh, hairstyling tools have been down in part because you're just not going into work in as many traveling formal events. But the, the concept of the natural and all that, and David will even talk about from a food perspective, is you almost got to think about where we were before the pandemic. Like the consumer was looking as part of a healthy lifestyle, this became part of it. And so I, it's the same thing when you saw the hairstyles even heading into the pandemic. It was a little bit more of a natural look, but although, although it still was unique in what they were trying to accomplish. So I think this desire to have a little bit overall of a health and wellness present, something that is more a little bit more natural, a little bit more uh, casual in that area, but also still looking. Same thing with products as sustainability. Like you see all that stuff kind of start to play into this. It'll come back strong as we come out of this. You know, we, we can see again in the area of health and wellness that touches each industry in its own way, but it also it fundamentally plays to a primary consumer mindset or uh, lifestyle aspiration, if you will. And, and, and again, as, the, as you fight for the share of wallet, all these industries are playing uh, against uh, common themes right now. And there is so much to learn uh, from these industries. Uh, I wanna thank our panelists today, Matt, Larissa, David, Steve, Joe. 
Uh, I encourage our membership to start thinking, about the, the Housewares Association membership, to start thinking beyond home and housewares more often. And I think NPD is a, is a good resource uh, to, to get some of that, uh, that insight. Um, so until we meet again, I just want to remind everyone that the uh, sessions will be recorded and available on the IHA website in mid-April. Um, if you have any other questions, direct them to us uh, and we'll see what we can do to get them answered for you. Thanks again, everyone from the NPD group. Uh, I'm Peter Gianetti and we will see you next time. Uh, don't forget to tune into the next Connect Spring sessions. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.